So Nita, I think it's working. And if you want to test the screen sharing, please feel free. Whatever you want to. Okay. Thanks. So we will wait maybe one or two more minutes and I will start the seminar. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can uh, just stop and people will really join. So welcome everyone. Or oh, just like to do a recording. Welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Mapping Math and Physics Seminar Series. Today we are very honored to have a Professor Neta Angel Hart from MIT, and she will be speaking about a uh, series of uh, works and a uh, review on the holography developments on the black hole information problem. And let's just directly welcome Neta. And please take over. Thank you. Actually, somehow I cannot hear you. Actually, earlier I wasn't being able to hear you. Not sure whether it's just from my side. I cannot hear you. Whether other people can hear, or maybe it's just my problem. Yeah, I cannot. People cannot. I, I don't hear anything either. Yeah. yeah. So I will say sorry in case earlier, Neta, you were saying anything. Actually, I didn't hear anything from you. Yeah, right now I think I hear something. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, perfect. Okay, all right. Sorry for that, yeah. I no, wasn't, no, it, I wasn't... Was, it was my end. Um, it was using okay. my laptop speaker instead of my uh, my actual speakers. So that's what was happening. Okay. Uh, let me go back to, I don't know what happened before, but this is the first time for everything. All right. Um... Okay, now let me go back to the sharing. Okay, uh, can you both see and hear? Yes. Point? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, great. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a uh, Pleasure to speak about the black hole information paradox, and in particular, to be given a whole hour and a half to speak on the black hole information problem. So um, I'm going to try to begin with a bit of a, a more of an overview uh, description of the problem for those who are unfamiliar with it, and the talk will sort of get progressively more and more technical. So hopefully, those who are looking for more technical details uh, will stick around for the for the end of it, which will be more technical than the beginning. 
So um, let me begin with sort of a caricature of the elevator pitch you often hear about the black hole information problem. So you have Alice and Bob and they're entangled and Alice ends up in the black hole and Bob doesn't end up in the black hole. And the black hole then disappears, meaning it evaporates, it just is gone from the system. Then Alice is gone as well. And we found that even though there used to be entanglement between Alice and Bob, now Bob is sort of left on his own. Alice doesn't exist in the universe anymore. And we've lost entanglement. Entanglement has been broken. And this is a paradox because here we have a prediction of gravity, which is black hole uh, evaporation. Um, we have prediction, black hole evaporation information being lost, meaning entanglement is broken, that is in conflict with unitarity of quantum mechanics, which is that unitary evolution has to preserve entanglement. Entanglement doesn't get broken by uh, unitary evolution. And quantum systems, closed quantum systems like the entire universe should be evolving unitarily. And in particular, this is a paradox because the predictions of semi-classical gravity are expected to be valid near the event horizon of a large black hole. So large black holes don't have a lot of space-time curvature near the event horizon, which means that we expect a effectively weakly coupled or decoupled description of, uh, of gravity and quantum mechanics to be more or less valid at the event horizon of a large black hole. So this is not a regime where we expect quantum gravity effects to kick in strongly and modify the physics. Now, why do we care so much about the information paradox other than the fact that we have conflicting predictions from two theories that are extremely uh, well verified empirically? Part of it is that information loss is, uh, is kind of a catastrophic uh, eventuality. Oh, I see there's a message in the chat. Um, Oh, okay, yeah, please feel free to, to just ask questions. Um, so one of the potential, um, one of the impl implication of information loss is, is going to be truly catastrophic for determinism of physics. So it, in particular, it would mean that the evolution of the entire universe is, is non-unitary. And put differently, that essentially means that if we are sitting here at this moment in time, and a bunch of black holes formed from different configurations of stars in the past, and then they evaporated. Looking at our present data right now, we would not be able to tell that those black holes formed from different types of stars. We would not be able to tell that those were different configurations. And in particular, we would not be able to uniquely evolve our current data towards the past. We cannot post the past. That's a catastrophic loss of determinism. In, in the physical theory of the universe. Now, of course, as physicists, we don't really get to, to choose what the universe does. So our, our job is to figure out um, what, whether actually there is information loss or not. And for reasons that I will explain, of course, we, we are very, uh, most of us, I would say, are, are very convinced that information is in fact conserved, but we have to understand why. Now, again, either way, there's a definitive answer because there is some, there are black holes in our universe, there is some theory that describes the interior, there is some description, something definitive happens. So we have to find the answer whether information is lost and we have a loss of determinism, whether it's not lost and how it's conserved. And of course, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel here is that the understanding the information paradox better has a lot that it can teach us about quantum gravity. So the information paradox essentially tells us there's some assumption we're making, something that we're missing, and understanding the paradox better has a very high potential for shedding light on quantum gravity with the potential catch-22 that we have to be able to get enough insight into the paradox without actually having a direct non-perturbative formulation of quantum gravity. So... I said in the beginning of the talk that it's very exciting for me to talk about the information paradox. I'm always happy to do that. And part of the reason is, especially in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of developments. It's the field, this field has moved very quickly over the last couple of years, uh, since, since 2019. And you might ask, uh, okay, well, what happened that has changed things? And of course, in this talk, I'm going to review those developments. 
But just to give you a, a kind of a over, overarching idea of what, what shifted, what was the paradigm shift that allowed us to all of a sudden accelerate our progress on this very old and very difficult problem. I'm just going to explain briefly what was the attitude and the ideas before and what happened to change that. So before 2019, I would say that um, there was a very, very much a prevailing understanding that uh, non-perturbative quantum gravity is simply a, a sine qua non for seeing evidence of unitarity in black hole evaporation, that you simply wouldn't be able to see any evidence of it, any compute, anything that's consistent with unitarity in black hole evaporation without having a direct access to a calculation that you can do in non-perturbative quantum gravity. And in particular, the conventional wisdom was that semi-classical gravity just appears to be losing information, that any calculation you do in semi-classical gravity is not going to know or have any indication that the black hole is evaporating unitarily. But somehow non-perturbative corrections add up and quantum gravity fixes it and information is found. Um, now, this was the conventional wisdom leading up to 2019. And you could ask what happened in 2019? Well, in 2019, there was, a, there was a series of two papers followed by many other papers, which were a purely semi-classical analysis that was a smoking gun signal of information conservation. And this kicked off renewed activity on the black hole information problem because all of a sudden we had a lot of tools, semi-classical tools in good control in a regime where we can actually calculate things that were sensitive to what appeared to be conservation of information. And I mean, I think, I think it's probably safe to say that um, this was, many of us thought this was impossible. I certainly thought this was impossible. Uh, and the fact that we could do it was really um, a rent to a renaissance of, uh, of developments on the information front, on the black hole information front. So that's the, the basic idea behind uh, what, what was the problem and what happened to change it. So, uh, and again, we still have the problem. I mean, black hole information paradox has not been resolved. So here's the outline of the talk. I know it looks long. Some of these are relatively short. So first I'm going to talk uh, very briefly just about what's the statement of the problem in a bit more detail. What is the information paradox? And then I'll get around to this, this semi-classical analysis that was done that was consistent with unitarity in 2019. So that's uh, quantum extremal surfaces in the page curve. Then the the sort of next big development that followed from that very quickly was a justification of this calculation. So this calculation was a little bit of a black box. And then there was a justification, which was also kind of a black box, but maybe you could say a black box that was a new one. Uh, and the this justification brought about interesting new ideas that were explored further. And, um, and I will discuss the sort of newer uh, approaches and avenues of research that I'm personally working on in the last bit of the talk. So uh, without further ado, let me talk a bit about the information paradox. And to do that, I'm first going to illustrate here very briefly and visually this uh, black hole formation and evaporation. So here we have this canonical 3D picture of a black hole that forms from collapse and some star, eventually event horizon form, black holes form, turn into a singularity, and here time runs upwards and here. And of course the light cones tilt at the event horizon so that time runs sort of towards the singularity in the interior. Now, okay, there we go. So I think there was, should have been one more thing here. Okay, well no. Um, black hole evaporation, is uh, simply a consequence of the fact that black holes have a temperature and an entropy in quantum gravity. So black holes have a temperature, that means that they radiate, and as they radiate, they can shrink, depending on the proportions of the temperature of the surroundings to the uh, temperature of the black hole. And as they shrink, they actually get hotter, so eventually they can disappear altogether. Now here is, I, I've drawn a picture of sort of entangled particles or modes across the horizon, here and here. So here's our Alice of before. And essentially the calculation of information loss, and I'll say more about it momentarily, but the basic idea is that in order to have a smooth horizon, what you, you have to have entanglement between the, the modes that are straddling it or between these two particles. And what happens when the black hole evaporates altogether, or really when the black hole is more than halfway through evaporation, what you find is that the, these outgoing modes or these outside particles appear to be in a thermal state. 
And in particular, they appear to be in a maximally mixed state, which is not, you can't have more than half the system in a maximally mixed state and the full system be pure. So essentially what happens is as this particle disappears from the system, this one remains in a, in a maximally mixed state with it, which means that you evolve from a pure state to a mixed state, which is in violation of unitarity. Um, so this is just repeating what I was just saying. Full system cannot be pure after evaporation. Now, how do we track information loss or information conservation? It's good to have a, a particular quantity that's sensitive to it that we can track through the process. And one, not the only, but one such quantity is the von Neumann entropy. Now, the von Neumann entropy of a quantum state density matrix rho is given by minus trace of rho log rho. Why do we like it? Why do we like tracking this quantity through the evaporation process? And I'll have a visual picture in a moment. Well, for one, it's invariant under unitary evolution. So that immediately means that if, if it's zero before the black hole has formed, then it, unitarity means it's zero after the black hole finished evaporating. It also vanishes for a pure state, and it's bounded from above by the thermal entropy, which is one of the reasons that we say information is lost when the von Neumann entropy increases, because the thermal state essentially is a state that has um, basically no information content. So if the von Neumann entropy increases, then it essentially the, the, this, the state is in some sense getting closer to being the thermal state and we have less and less information in it. It's sort of rough intuition there. So here's the, this idea of the calculation minus trace of rho log rho. So we can imagine computing the entropy of the quantum state of the um, inner space time. Bulk here refers to something I'll introduce in a moment. So we compute the, the von Neumann entropy of, uh, you can say everything outside the black hole. So, call this the radiation of the black hole. Before the black hole is formed, this is just some star. And we everything outside the black hole is literally just everything in the universe. So we can compute this von Neumann entropy. During the evaporation process, so here we have some event horizon, and this is the these are the radiated outgoing modes. We compute the von Neumann entropy of everything outside of the black hole. So this includes all of these orange modes here. So that's on this time slice, this is the the event horizon, we compute the von Neumann entropy of everything outside of it. And then after the black hole finishes evaporating, we compute the von Neumann entropy of everything outside the black hole, which is once again, everything in the universe. And we find using Hawking's calculation that this is a thermal state. So the, here's the black hole information paradox in a nutshell as phrased in terms of the von Neumann entropy. So we say, suppose you have some pure quantum state that collapses into a black hole. Before the black hole is formed, the von Neumann entropy outside the black hole is the von Neumann entropy of the entire universe, and it's zero, because remember, the von Neumann entropy of a pure state is zero. Now, as I said before, black holes are thermal, they have a temperature, they can radiate, and we can have this radiation process by which the black hole gradually can ev evaporate. So at intermediate times, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation, which is the von Neumann entropy of everything outside the black hole, so these two are equal. This is just, is gonna be greater than zero. The reason it's greater than zero is because we're not looking at the entire system. We're not looking at a subset of the system. Just looking at the everything outside the black hole rather than everything in the universe. So we say, no problem. This can be greater than zero. And in particular, as we've discussed earlier, the, these outgoing modes have to be entangled with modes behind the horizon in order to have a smooth horizon, which means that the von Neumann entropy of just the outgoing modes has to be non-zero since they're in an entangled state with something that's not in the system. Now, the black hole can continue to evaporate. And after it evaporates, we say, well, now we have access to the whole universe again. The von Neumann entropy of the radiation is the von Neumann entropy of the whole universe, which is should be by unitarity, by unitary evolution, it should be zero. But that's not what Hawking found. So what Hawking found is that the von Neumann entropy just keeps on increasing until eventually it saturates, it plateaus out here post evaporation. And that means that the state post evaporation is mixed, even though it started out as pure, which is not consistent with unitarity. Now, what would a unitary curve look like? That's something called the page curve, simply because it was Don Page who proposed it. Now you can ask, what does a unitary curve look like? Well, for one, 
here we're computing the entropy of the whole universe. Here we're computing the entropy of the whole universe. If the entire universe is evolving unitarily, then the entropy here, if the entropy here is zero, then the entropy here has to be zero as well after the black hole is fully evaporated. Which in particular means that the while the entropy can go up when we're looking at just a subset of the system, just the black hole exterior, when the black hole is non-trivial, at some point it has to turn over and go back down. And so this, this non-monotonic curve, the page curve, is what we expect to see if we have unitary evaporation. So that's the that, that's essentially all I want to say as far as an introduction to the black hole information, uh, information problem. And you'll notice that I focused on this von Neumann entropy aspect of it simply because that was sort of the key to these new developments um, from 2019 onwards. So let me give a bit of a perspective on, um, on where we're going with these new developments. So if you're just looking at Hawking's calculation in semi-classical gravity, it's a very robust calculation. And it's really a tour de force calculation. And it's really difficult to see where the analysis goes wrong. It's, it's hard to pick out a mistake. It's, it looks very robust. And so it seems that somehow we need some ingredient from, from not from semi-classical gravity, but from quantum gravity to help us figure out where the analysis goes wrong. Uh, Jim, was that a question? Yes, naive question. I just yeah. wonder, the previous data you mentioned about this uh, infolding maybe or outgoing particles, when you mm -hmm. mentioned particle, I was wondering say whether you fundamentally some excitation are not particle-like, as that, uh, uh, whether one need to maybe consider alternate, maybe, you know, maybe uh, computations or, or slightly modify, just, just wonder. <laughs> For example, we know like uh, there are extend objects in a lot of quantum field theory. No, but especially people discuss defects or line surface operator. I was wondering so whether these type of things will affect some discussion. I'm certainly sure that particle will be one important scenario. Just wonder whether, whether other, other type of excitations uh, um, modifies anything. I, uh, I, yeah. I, really, I really wouldn't think so. Um, uh -huh. So, I mean, you can do a more, a, a subtle, a sort of more subtle analysis at the um, event horizon, and then you, you might run into some some issues asking about objects that are sort of extended across it, mm -hmm. but um, and, but I, I'm I, I'm pretty sure that there is uh, yeah you you can make that work, but an easy way to to just see that the that you have to have um, a turnover in the in a sort of the page curve, or you have to like, you you do run into a problem, mm -hmm. is just looking at the state before and the state after. And then you don't actually have to ask to worry about, well, what happened to an extended object that sort of straddles the event horizon? You just mm -hmm. say, well, if we have a before and after, and there's no event horizon in either one of these pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and but, but you still run into a problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I'm maybe I'm not sure this is 100 percent addresses what you were asking, but um, and and yeah, the, the, and, and, the, and the solution or resolution you'll provide will. Will also be solved for those cases for the maybe so extended object. I am not going to resolve the information paradox in this chapter. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, absolutely not. And I, yeah, I'm going to talk about the um, the progress we've made, but that is a far cry from a resolution. Okay. All right. Thank you. But but they will be mostly focused on excitation, which are particle likes. Um, I'll mostly focus on um. Yeah, I'm mostly focused on these mode on on looking at these modes here because I want to be able to calculate von Neumann entropies. And if, it's not like we don't have some idea of how to calculate von Neumann entropy when you have uh, more complicated situations. But um, it's it's enough to illustrate the problem yeah, by just looking at that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. So here. Um, okay, so now what, so as, as I mentioned, what we, it seems that we need an ingredient for quantum gravity to figure out what's going on here, what's, what, 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 where Hawking went wrong, simply because his analysis is so robust. Now, what, um, what was different and, and helpful in these new developments is actually a completely semi-classical calculation that reproduces the, the unitary page curve, the curve that goes up and turns back down. It doesn't use non-perturbative, strong quantum gravity anywhere in the calculation, but it does invoke it in the sense that of how the calculation is interpreted 
or motivated. And the sense in which it is motivated from quantum gravity is that we, we inherit this calculation, this way of, of computing of a Neumann entropy that's different from the one that gives us the information loss is inherited from holography. So um, I'm sure this audience is, uh, has seen the soup can slide many times, but I sort of have the obligatory um, ADS CFT slide here just to remind uh, all of you what we, what we mean by holography. So yeah, holography, also known as ADS CFT or gauge gravity duality, is a duality between quantum gravity with ADS boundary conditions, which we call the bulk, and a lower dimensional non gravitational quantum field theory that lives on a copy of the asymptotic boundary of our bulk. So we call this, we often call this the boundary. It's a bit of a misnomer. It doesn't actually live on the boundary, but on a copy of it. But um, we'll still call it the boundary in a bit of an abusive notation. And typically, we work in the limit where quantum gravity becomes semi classical gravity. But this duality is conjectured to hold even when we have full non perturbative quantum gravity um, in the bulk. So what's the idea here? We already know that if we compute entropy in the bulk in our quantum gravity ADS via this usual formula, so minus trace of rho, rho log rho, we're going to get the Hawking curve. So we already know that for a fact. That's essentially the Hawking calculation. It's not unitary. So how can we use ADS CFT to do a gravitational calculation of a unitary von Neumann entropy? Well, we know say on the back of the soup can, if we look at the dual CFT at different moments in time, well, it's certainly, it will be evolving unitarily. It's just a standard closed quantum system and it evolves, it has unitary evolution. So this von Neumann entropy is evolving unitarily. And in particular, that also means that the full quantum gravity theory evolves through the black hole evaporation process unitarily. So information isn't actually lost. And the idea is to compute the entropy of the boundary minus trace row boundary log row boundary, but to use the gravitational semi-classical bulk. And the way we do this is using the holographic dictionary that gives us a way of translating quantities in the bulk into quantities on the boundary. So in particular, it gives us, there's a holographic entry, holographic dictionary entry that relates boundary entropies to gravitational quantities in the bulk. And there, it didn't have to work. Um, we could have said, oh, the, the, this, this holographic dictionary entry needs to be modified to account for quantum gravity corrections that are ex explicitly uh, non perturbative But remarkably, it does turn out that if you do a holographic calculation in the semi-classical regime using no additional non perturbative quantum gravity corrections, you do actually get a gravitational calculation of a unitary page curve. And this, in some sense, gave us a new set of tools for, uh, or a new use of an existing set of tool towards for getting insight into the information problem. So what is the dictionary entry that makes this possible? It's the so-called quantum extremal surface prescription. So the von Neumann entropy of a density matrix on the boundary that has a bulk dual, where the bulk dual is well described by the semi-classical regime, meaning that effective field theory is valid then the von Neumann entropy of this boundary density matrix is given by the area of a surface chi that I'll say more about in a moment, over four in Planck units, plus the von Neumann entropy of quantum fields outside of chi. So here's a surface chi, and the chi, so we take the area of chi, we take the von Neumann entropy of quantum fields between chi and the asymptotic boundary, and we compute the sum of these two quantities, which is called the generalized entropy of the, of the surface chi. Now, of course, not any surface will, not just any surface will do here. Um, obviously, different surfaces will have different generalized entropies. We will compute this specifically for what we called a quantum extremal surface. And a quantum extremal surface is a surface that has the very special following property that if you slightly wiggle its location, if you perturb its location, then the generalized entropy of the surface is stationary to leading order in the perturbation in all directions. So if you perturb it slightly in a time-like direction, if you perturb it slightly in a space-like direction, in any space-like direction, null direction, um, all of these perturbations will result in 
vanishing change to the generalized entropy to leading order in the perturbation. Now, you might end up having more than one quantum extremal surface. That's OK. In that case, we will just use the minimal one. So that is the, so if you have more than one, you use the one with the smallest value of the generalized entropy among all possible quantum extremal surfaces. Now, there was a general, I should say this is, this builds on an earlier formula that was, that works purely in this classical regime, but there are no quantum fields in your bulk. And then you just extremize the area instead of the area plus the von Neumann entropy, because in the purely classical regime, bulk quantum fields don't, don't contribute. Um, now, the, there was a general expectation prior to 2019 that quantum extremal surfaces lie very close to their classical counterparts. In other words, extremizing this doesn't move you very far away from the extremum of this. And that turned out to be woefully wrong uh, in very interesting ways. And in fact, in the fact that this is wrong, the fact that there exist quantum extremal surfaces that are very far from their classical counterparts, even in the semi-classical regime where we just have perturbative quantum gravity, even in that regime, we can have very far separated classical and quantum extremal surfaces. And that, in fact, is what allows us to have this turnover in the page curve be reproduced from this holographic formula. Uh, Neta, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't understand in the previous slide when you said you're still going to be computing the boundary phenomenon entropy because you said you already know that's unitary. And I, yes. I'm kind of confused. I, I thought that these calculations were where you couple ADS to a bath. Um, I'll get there. I'll get there. But, you, but your point of view is you're always computing boundary entropy and hanging entropy. So, so I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but for now. Okay. Um, if you want to, so, you know, if you just look at this, yeah. imagine you have a very small ADS black hole that doesn't need any bath coupling or anything. It's a very small ADS black hole that just evaporates and without needing any, anything else. That process is described in the book by some, some physics, but on the boundary, we have purely unitary evolution. And what that tells us is that we have the prediction of unitary evaporation of black holes. Now you're right that large black holes don't evaporate in ADS. And so we have to force them to evaporate. And then it's the, the way we force them to evaporate, I'll discuss in a moment, but it just means that we add another an auxiliary system. And then the evolution that we expect to be unitary is, um, well, we, we expect to have unitary evolution for the whole system. So I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. I see, but for the case of a small black hole, you're saying you still learn something. I'm just a little confused about what you learn if you already know that in the boundary CFT, we know it's a unitary system, so it's it's going to evolve unitarily. But are you saying that via the um, holographic entanglement entry formula, you're learning something new about how the bulk works? Or um, so, so yes, there. yes. So if you just look at the small ADS black hole and you say the small ADS black hole is just an ordinary non-gravitational quantum state in the lower dimensional dual quantum field theory. And because that evolves unitarily, that tells us that the black hole in ADS evaporates in a unit, evaporation is a unitary process. So if you recall in the beginning, I asked, is black hole evaporation unitary or does quantum gravity actually lose information? And this answered the question with a resounding, no, quantum gravity does not lose information. It conserves information and we get unitary evolution because the, eva the evolution of a small evaporating black hole is, is, is completely is dual to the evolution of the standard um, quantum state of a standard quantum field theory evolving forwards in time. So that answers the question of whether we can have unitary black hole evaporation in quantum gravity. So this is this is what this addresses for us, for one. Does that, does that so far make sense? Yeah. Okay. So then we might, so the, the problem with this, which I haven't, I'm, now I'm just giving an overview. The problem is if we want to do a holographic calculation of this entropy, which evolves unitarily, then we need a good description of the bulk. And we don't really understand uh, very small ADS black holes. So we're gonna have to work with a large ADS black hole. That's a complication I'll get to in a moment. I see. Yeah. So if you can just hold off on the, on this, the second part of your question for just two minutes and I'll, I'll get there and then we'll see if I address it. And if not, it'll be easy to address it then because I'll have introduced some new concepts. Uh, sure, thanks. 
So the, 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 the idea here is that we want to compute an entropy that we know evolves unitarily, which is the entropy in the dual boundary theory. We want to use the semi-classical bulk. And we want to do this using the holographic dictionary that relates boundary entropies to gravitational bulk quantities. That allows us to do a gravitational calculation of what should be a unitarily evolving quantity. And it turns out that this does actually work, and this does give a unitary calculation of a, of a, a gravitational calculation of a unitary page curve. So I just already talked about this. Okay, so now we actually get to the very, very shortly to the question. So let's consider a black hole evaporating in ADS. Um, now, black holes, large black holes in ADS don't actually evaporate because ADS is like a box. So radiation just bounces off of the, of the box and it comes right back in and the black hole equilibrates. So what we ended up having to do is to force the black hole to evaporate. And but we, the way we do this is by replacing the sides of the ADS box with essentially a cold bath. So here we have our bulk system. This is in, in one plus one dimensions. And we have some cold bath. And at some point, we so here we have reflecting boundary conditions. This is the boundary. And at some point, we couple these two together and we allow trans, we have transparent boundary conditions, which means that the radiation from the black hole can now escape into the bath and the black hole can evaporate into the bath. And at that point, then, what we're interested in is computing the entropy of the, um, of the, of the radiation. And we want to do that using our holographic entanglement entropy formula. So here I'm going to be computing the von Neumann entropy using the holographic formula. So initially at early times, if you're working with a single sided black hole form from collapse, the von Neumann entropy of the, um, of, of the radiation, everything outside of the black hole, is literally just going to be the von Neumann entropy um, of everything. Now, as the black hole evaporates into the external system, what happens is that the entropy of the empty sets, the, the dominant quantum extremal surface is going to be the empty set, um, that's going to be to start increasing as the black hole evaporates into the auxiliary system. And what happens about um, after, right after the page time or at the page time, the dominant quantum extremal surface. So here we have a Penrose diagram of the black hole. This is our reservoir, the bath that we've coupled to the CFT. And after the page time, what happens is that our dominant quantum extremal surface, which was the empty set, is no longer the empty set. We have a new quantum extremal surface that appears drawn it around here. This new quantum extremal surface and its generalized entropy actually decreases. And the effect of this transition from the empty set to this new quantum extremal surface is a unitary page curve in the bulk. So here is a um, maybe a more helpful diagram. So after the black hole is evaporated, uh, more than half its mass, we have a new quantum extremal surface right here that lives behind the event horizon, whose generalized entropy is smaller than the generalized entropy of the empty set. And as we evolve forwards in time, this entropy decreases, this generalized entropy of the quantum extremal surface, which is computing the entropy of the radiation, it decreases. So what we get instead of the Hawking curve, which just increases until the black hole finishes evaporating, is we get a curve that de increases and then decreases. Um, now, I should say that in the semi-classical regime, you know, th this, this piece here is really when the black hole actually evaporates, we don't have good control over it. But just to see the effect of unitarity, really all we have to see is just that this thing begins to, to decrease, continues to decrease. So that means that the page curve or most of the page curve that is consistent with unitary evolution can be obtained using only semi-classical physics, just doing the quantum extremal surface formula instead of minus trace of rho log rho. Now, this is very helpful. It gives us a way of computing things that appear to be consistent with unitarity using tools that we know how to control. But of course, now that we've sort of opened um, one avenue of, of research we've had an insight, we want to understand why does this work? It seems like a black box. You say, I want to compute this, the entropy of the radiation. We say, OK, use the quantum extremal surface formula. Ta-da, you get a uh, unitary entropy. But we want to understand 
how information gets out, how to resolve the paradox. And that means that we have we want to understand why this works. So why does the quantum extremal surface prescription work? Why does quantum gravity repackage entropy in this particular way? And what microscopic Planckian physics is responsible for the success of the quantum extremal surface prescription? It seems kind of, uh, I mean, we proposed it because we thought it was well motivated, but it still seems somewhat um, surprising and maybe even ad hoc that this formula actually works. So that means we can uh, move, on, move on to justifying the quantum extremal surface prescription, the calculation. So some progress on this front of justifying the formula. Let's take a step back and ask, how do we generally compute entropies? Well, typically speaking, we can compute the von Neumann entropy using the replica trick. So let's forget about gravity. Just think about some standard non-gravitational quantum theory. We can compute the von Neumann entropy using the very famous replica trick. This doesn't involve gravity in any way. We just take, we, we, we write it like this, which means that we introduce n independent copies or replicas of this gravitational system. So rho to the n is the density matrix on n copies of the non-gravitational theory. And then we take this derivative, we take the limit as n goes to one. So we end up with, uh, we take the limit as the number of replicas goes to one and we get the von Neumann entropy. Now we actually also know how to, um, well, okay, maybe I should say, say this first. So, okay, if we can work in Euclidean time and we're computing the von Neumann entropy, of some density matrix and maybe reduced on a region R, then we can rewrite this replica trick in terms of the partition function on the space B where our theory lives. And we're, and also B sub N, which is this N sheeted geometry, these N, N copies, the N replicas, which are identified along cyclic, which are sort of cut along R and cyclically identified along it. So this is identified with that, this will be identified with the next one, and this will be identified back with that one. So this is just a purely a rewriting of the previous formula. Whenever we're working, we can work with Euclidean time, so we can rewrite uh, trace rho to the n in terms of the partition function on n copies of the system. Now, this is very useful because we know how to translate the partition function of the of, of, of this theory of, of a quantum theory into the gravitational path integral when we're working with gravity. So this was done in particular in for a couple of different toy models by the so-called East Coast and West Coast groups. So in this case, uh, maybe I, I don't have to go too much into the detail of these calculations, but the basic idea here is that these are both in two one plus one dimensions. Here we have um, so we have ADS. And this is the bath that's coupled to it. And here we also have uh, ADS2, but now we have an end of the world brain. And the, the, the important point is that for each of these two toy models, we're always working in a situation where we can um, recast the problem in Euclidean time. We can analyze, we can continue to Euclidean time, we can work with the Euclidean time, which means that we have a nice way of rewriting the, um, the replica trick in terms of the partition function. And, um, and what these essentially what these groups did, which I'm going to mostly focus here on the East Coast calculations, this is a little bit more intuitive, is uh, give a derivation of the unitary page curve, and in particular, a justification of the quantum extremal surface formula for the radiation using the gravitational replica trick. And I should emphasize the fact that this is a toy model in 2D gravity, and that is very important and turned out to be very important. Okay, so how does this actually work? So we say, okay, we can replace the partition function Z with the gravitational path integral. So Z of B goes to the gravitational path integral with, on the, with boundary conditions B, meaning we put boundary conditions, we fix the boundary conditions, and then we do this gravitational path integral, which we typically use a saddle point approximation for where we enforce these boundary conditions. So we essentially ask what gravitational um, what, what gravity can fill in these boundary conditions. And here is, uh, we also do the same thing for Z of B sub N, the partition function on N copies of the system. And we do, we do a gravitational path integral on um, the boundary, where the boundary is now B sub N. So um, in particular for these East and West Coast models, or the East Coast model, the, this, this identified region um, 
the region R that is where we do the cut is outside of the gravitational region, which means that the boundary conditions in our gravitational path integral are just the boundary of ADS. So the gravity part is just the boundary of ADS. There's nothing identified there. So here is the picture. This is the ADS boundary in Euclidean time. We have n copies of this. This is the region whose entropy we're interested in, in computing. This is the, the bath where the radiation ends up. And what, what, and what was sort of interesting, surprising, and um, generated a lot of new progress was the fact that the gravitational path integral on n copies of, on b to the, on b to the n on n copies of b is not the same as the gravitational path integral on a single copy of B raised to the power N. You also have connected topologies that can contribute. So here we have B2, B2 powers, two copies of B. And it's possible for the gravitational path integral to fill this in by having a connection, sort of a, a wormhole going between these two, which this of course would contribute over here and would mean that there's, there isn't a factorization of PB to the N equaling PB raised to the power N. Now, there was a lot of discussion on whether these connected topologies should be allowed to contribute to the gravitational path integral because they result in non-factorization of what appear to be N independent copies and suggest that there may be some kind of ensemble averaging going on. They were actually, and sometimes discarded, um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they quite the word discarded, but they were disfavored for that reason. And in fact, in this paper, there was an argument said that may, these things shouldn't contribute to the gravitational path integral. We shouldn't uh, take these contributions seriously. But the East and West Coast models essentially found, these groups found that if you, con if you contribute, if you allow these contributions from the connected topologies, they actually exactly correspond to the new quantum extremal surface that results in the downturn in the page curve. And so this rejuvenated the uh, discussion on the contributions from these connected topologies, because including them appears to give us a way to give to do a calculation that is consistent with unitarity. So should these topologies be included? Well, again, these topologies result in a unitary page curve. We'd like to include them. Of course, that also means that we don't have factorization of the gravitational path integral, which means that we don't have factorization of the partition function. So the partition function on n copies of the theory is not the same as the partition function on one copy raised to the power n. Now, that is very strange, but there is another possibility, which has long been discussed in the literature, which is that the gravitational path integral actually computes an ensemble average over the partition function. Now, there are other possibilities here. One is that you have some non-perturbative corrections, extra non-perturbative corrections that restore factorization at this level. Um, a third possibility is you say, oh, the gravitational path integral is just a really good tool for computing quantities that are self-averaging in sort of a single chaotic theory, maybe doing an averaging over states. Um, this has generated a lot of activity. I'm going to be agnostic about whether the gravitational path integral is actually doing an ensemble averaging or not, but I'm just going to make a comment on this. So what do we mean by uh, ensemble or disorder averaging? Typically what we mean is that we have some um, partition function here that we label with a choice G of coupling constants, and it's sampled for some distribution. And so what we mean by the, um, the average over Z of B is kind of an average with respect to this, which is sampled average over couplings, which is sampled from a particular distribution. Now, this is one way of getting around the issue that we, that this appears to imply that, but if, in fact, that is what's happening, that the gravitational path integral is computing some kind of an average um, in, in gravity, it's not obvious what an individual member of the ensemble actually is. 
Um, again, this is an aside. I don't want to subscribe necessarily to the interpretation that the gravitational path integral is computing an ensemble average. Um, I'm always happy to discuss this further. I think it's a very interesting point, but I also think that we're not really, we, we have not solved this problem and there's still many different possibilities that are, um, that are va valid and valuable. Okay, uh, Jivin, yeah. Yes, maybe a naive question. So you are discussing maybe uh, the uh, contribution from topology in the previous slide and say some quantity may not be equal. I was wondering, say, whether this inequality will just be up to some uh, topological number or something like that. So I, I just want to know what exactly is the emphasis of this slide. Is there something you are not happy about, about the contribution from topologies? Um so I'm, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Um, the, the important point here is that um, even when you work in a saddle point approximation, you still end up having, okay, so, so first of all, okay, when if you don't work in a saddle point approximation, I don't know what happened, but if you work, even if you work in a saddle point approximation, you, these two are not equal, and that, that's okay. So long as the gravitational path integral isn't actually computing exactly a partition function of n independent copies, because if it is, then we should not, we should not have th th this should not be happening. Um, now, whether this comes, the fact that this comes from the uh, connected topologies, that is sort of um, that, that's the reason that we have the inequality. But whether the, it, but if, even if it came from some other effect, we would be just as concerned that it appears to imply something that's inconsistent. I'm not 100% sure I understood the question though. Does that answer it or not quite? Yeah. Uh, maybe also let me try to clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, am I correct that you are trying to say there are some contribution maybe from uh, some uh, genus number or Euler number or maybe some dis disconnect uh, different components of the topology of space time that have a contributions? What, oh, what no, that no, that's not, oh, good. That's not that's what not I mean. A, no, that's, not that's not what I mean. Um, so what's, what what's I mean Right, so what's a topological result to the really Yeah, so what I mean here um, is, let me go back. Um, oh, where did I go? I had, sorry. Um, one second, I had this picture here. Oh, there it is. Okay. So the the fact it's not just some, you know, some contribution to the topology that we worry about here. What we're seeing in this East and West Coast papers is that the connected topology literally dominates over the other terms. So it's the dominant contribution, not some correction term. Even if it were some correction term, there would be some concern about the fact that it's not equal, but the fact that it's a dominant saddle, that's, that, that's, the, that's a real concern right there. So it's not just some order one number that you know we add some handles. This is a solution to the um, the equations of motion with certain boundary conditions. So it's on shell, and it's um, and it's dominant. Um, Neha, I also have a question here. Yeah. Um, just to repeat my previous question. So in this calculation that you showed in the replica trick, mm -hmm. the region where you're computing the tangent entropy. Um, it's, it's sort of like a bulk region, right? It's not like a- No, it's, it's not. It, yeah, so that's, a, that, that's a, I think, a confusion that comes up a lot. Um, so maybe let me, yeah, there we go. So the way we draw this picture is, a, I think, a little bit misleading because you think, oh, this is, a, this, this is really, it should be thought of as sort of part of the bulk. But the way that I prefer to think about it is that this theory here, we actually couple it to the, let's call this, this, this is also a fundamental quantum system, it's called a quantum dot. We actually couple this non-gravitational theory to the quantum dot. And so really we, we should think of this as being coupled, being at the same level as the boundary theory. We've coupled a, a flat path to our quantum dot. And there's, and, and our, our quantum dot is sort of allowed to, um, you could say evaporate into that cold bath because our quantum dot has some temperature. And we're computing the entropy of the of the bath that's coupled to our quantum dot. So it, I would not think of it as a bulk region. Um, but let me say it in a different way, uh, like um, it, it's not living in one lower. I mean, the, the actual region itself is not in one lower dimension, right? So the the the, the dimension of R is um, yes, it's co dimension one in the bulk. That's right. That's right. So the the, re, the, the region R is um, it's a two. So this is a two dimensional bath, and this is a two dimensional bulk. That's correct. 
Um, but also, would you expect, so for example, you say there's no gravity there, but you know, we know that there, there is going to be like, this is an approximation to a situation where you will want to have gravity even in the flat region, right? Like that. You, no, 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 I, I do not want to think of it that way. Um, so this, some people have advocated thinking of this as kind of like a black hole evaporating in flat space. I think there are a lot of problems with that and I don't subscribe to that viewpoint. Here, this is just an artifact for us to be able to extract the entropy, to, to extract the, the outgoing modes for the radiation so they don't bounce off of the boundary. So this is not a gravitating region and it's not, I don't want to approximate, I want to think of it as approximating a gravitating region either. So I understand that, but what I'm trying to say is that suppose I asked you a question about our, like, do a calculation in our real world, right? Then so we why don't, don't you, yeah, if, you, if, so, if you have a question about non-ADS, why don't you hold on to it? Okay, Because okay. this, so far, um, I'm talking about black holes in ADS and I'm forcing them to evaporate by coupling them to a bath, but I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not having a discussion about flat space. Now, this, the, the, the Euclidean gravity, gra the, the Euclidean gravitational path integral, a calculation that you can do that I'm, you know, the, so the one that I'm discussing now, where you essentially um, plug in this into the gravity, into the replica trick, that you can, that calculation you can also imagine doing in flat space, in asymptotically flat space. Now, you could ask in that situation whether you're really justified in thinking of this partition function as the partition function of some dual CFT, maybe, maybe not. But if you're willing to accept that the gravitational path integral is computing for you some kind of a partition function, then you can do a gravitational path integral calculation of the von Neumann entropy using the replica trick in asymptotically flat space. And people have done that. And they've gotten something essentially the same as in, in, in ADS. So you can do this in that case. The only reason I prefer to stick to ADS myself, even though I think those calculations are very interesting, is that in ADS, I know how to interpret every single quantity here. In asymptotically flat space, you have to be, take a bit of a leap of faith of asking what is the gravitational path integral actually mean in asymptotically flat space. But if you're willing to accept that it computes some kind of a partition function and you plug it into the von Neumann entropy, then you still get a, a page curve. Okay? Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see, where was I? Um, good. Okay, so we want to take these the so called replica wormholes, these connected topologies with a wormhole between them, between the boundaries. We want to take them seriously because they give us unitarity. But then we also need to understand a little bit better what kind of calculation the gravitational path integral is actually doing because it, there's some non factorization going on. So if it's averaging, what is it averaging over? What are the implications of this for other observables? Can we see signatures of this averaging or this non-factorization in other observables? Um, we, can, we know we can see them in the so-called Rennie entropies, which are just the, not, the, the von Neumann entropy formula, uh, the replica trick without taking n to one. We can already see them there. There's just many copies and we see the connected topologies. But um, what about other observables? For example, we might ask about the generating functional log Z or the free energy minus T log Z. So things we might ask about that in some sense are more fundamental than the entropy. And so this leads me to um, talking about replica wormholes and, um, and other observables. So let's talk about computing the generating functional from the gravitational path integral. So if the gravitational path integral receives contributions from connected topologies, then in principle, it's possible that there's a big difference between log of Z as computed from the gravitational path integral. I'm going to use an overline to mean whatever it is the gravitational path integral does. Um, and if it's not ensemble averaging, then some, something else versus something like an average over the log of Z. So these two could potentially be very different if the gravitational path integral is heavily non-factorizing. For example, in condensed matter systems, this type of uh, free energy is called the annealed, uh, I guess the generating function is called annealed. And this computes an average over, um, over random variables that define a very particular instance of an ensemble. As opposed to um, this one, 
so sorry, this, as I say here, this is just an interpretation of a you know, generating functional log of the overline with a theory where they, you're allowing your random variables over which you're doing the averaging to equilibrate over which you want to do the averaging to equilibrate, which is not what we're interested in. What we're interested in is this sort of quenched, um, quenched generating functional, which computes an average over the, the free energies that you have at minus t here of constituents of the ensemble. So here the random variables are not allowed to equilibrate. So this is clearly the one that we are interested in for, for gravity. So now, even if the gravitational path integral is not actually computing an ensemble averaging, it seems that we, we, we care about doing this average, we, we, whatever it is the gravitational path integral is doing, we care about doing it for every member of the ensemble, every state, whatever the average is, if it's an average. Um, this is the thing that we end up caring about. And so if this, this overline of z of b to the n is not the same as z of, of b overline raised to the power n, then we would expect, again, that these two are not the same. And now, so the question is, how do we make sense? How do we compute something like overline log z from the gravitational path integral? Well, we, can, we compute this by a replica trick, a different replica trick. It's not new. It's not something, maybe something that we've discovered more recently, but condensed matter theorists have been doing this for decades. It's a different type of replica trick. Once again, and I'm going to use the letter, letter M to refer to it, so it's not confused with the letter N that I'm using for the replicas of the von Neumann entropy. So you'll notice this replica trick take M, takes M to one, but it's also a different uh, formula here as well. One over M, not one over M minus one, et cetera. So here we have Z of B raised to the power M. So again, M copies of the system. And we take this, this, uh, this replica trick. Now, of course, computing this is very easy from the gravitational path integral. This we know how to do. And so log Z of B to the N, sorry, this average or whatever it is the gravitational path integral is doing can be computed from this a different replica trick. Okay, so if replica wormholes can contribute non-trivially to the generating functional in the limit where the number of replicas goes to zero, so in the limit where we're taking this, um, this replica trick, then the quenched and annealed free energies would be extremely different. So the, quite, the, the annealed uh, generating functional would only include disconnected topologies since we're only ever considering one copy of the system. Whereas the quenched free energy could include contributions from connected saddles or from connected topologies. So that's what this would be computing here. So we would like to understand which one is the, which of these is the gravitational path integral actually computing? Do replica wormholes have an imprint on more general observables? If they have an imprint on the generating functional, then they have an imprint on a lot more than just the entropy. So let's see this, uh, this, this in action. So in fact, it turns out if you want to correctly compute the phenomenon entropy in a holographic theory, using the gravitational path integral, whatever kind of averaging it's doing, then you want to take the sort of overline von Neumann entropy, which means that here is the, you have to do two replica tricks. Here's the first one, that's the von Neumann entropy replica trick that computes minus trace row log row for you from n replicas cut along the region R and cyclically identified. But then for each one of these, you have to add an additional replica trick to compute the log. And so really what we have is a compounded replica trick. This is actually the correct way to compute the von Neumann entropy in a theory where you're using the gravitational path integral. So what this looks like, so here we have n copies of the, uh, of the theory for the von Neumann entropy replica trick. And we have n copies of each of these for the replica trick of, that computes the, um, the, the log. So this, this complicated manifold here, uh, I'm, we're, I'm going to call it bn to the m. So n copies for the phenomenon entropy, n copies for the uh, for log z. So we can actually see this, uh, this. We can see that this is important just by looking at the phenomenon entropy. So we say, okay, we have, let's compute the phenomenon entropy for a pure state. So where rho is equal to some pure state. Well, suppose we don't know that we should use the log z replica trick. Well, we're just going to use the annealed, uh, the, the annealed formula here. 
And even if replica wormholes are not, they don't contribute at leading order to the generating functional, even if they contribute at sub, some very, very subleading order, if they contribute at any order at all, then this quantity is not going to vanish identically for a pure state, okay? Because log of this is not going to be n log of that. Now, for a pure state, if we use the log z replica trick, we can actually rewrite this formula in this way by re redefining this variable m tilde. And I'm not going to go through the detail of the equation here, but you just plug this right back in. And you find that regardless of whether replica wormholes contribute or not, this quantity is always going to be identically zero for a pure state, as opposed to this quantity, which could have subleading contributions, even though for a pure state, the entropy needs to be identically zero with no subleading contributions whatsoever. Uh, sorry, um, I think I'm quite confused here. Um, yeah. Two things. One is that this extra averaging you're doing, I'm confused why I didn't see that in the previous calculation, the, the East Coast calculation of the, uh, with replica wormholes. There yeah. was, no, there was well, no such overbar, right? There was no overbar. There was no overbar. Um, and what, so the, here's the problem with that calculation, right? They said, okay, let's do, let's compute the von Neumann entropy from the gravitational path integral. And then they said, okay, um, the, when we found that the gravitational path integral doesn't factorize over the n copies. And so they said, okay, replica wormholes dominate and we get some answer. But what, something, there's something that they forgot to include, which is that this quantity log of P of B sub N is not the same of the, so th th this quantity is the annealed free energy. And if replica wormholes are allowed to contribute, then the annealed free energy is not the correct, free, the, the annealed generating functional is not correct. So yes, you have an overbar here and you did not over there. There should have been an overbar there. And the reason that there should have been an overbar there is that they were doing a calculation where they were using the gravitational path integral, but they used it only once when they should have used it twice. So to be a little bit clearer, if you do their calculation, and you say, okay, I want to compute the, the von Neumann entropy of a pure state using the East Coast calculation. You should get zero. But actually, you get zero to leading order, but not zero to subleading order. You can show this. And if and you say, well, it's a pure state, so something went wrong. And so what was wrong is that they didn't include contributions from the annealed, uh, from the quenched generating functional. So this is what they should have done. This is the, the replica trick that they should have done, this one here, but they actually forgot about the M and they only did one replica trick. So fortunately for them, the replica wormholes do not contribute in what they will, in, what, in the system they were looking at, they don't contribute at leading order to the generating functional. So their answer was still correct at leading order, but it was not correct at subleading order because they forgot this extra replica trick. Um, I see. I have even maybe a more basic question. When you have this d to the n manifold, it's uh, glued along the cut, right? So it, yeah. it would never be. When, when you, I'm kind of confused about you. are saying why is the partition from the plus function there not just n times a single copy? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that never true? Once you glue along the cut, it's yeah, not yeah. True. Great, great question. Let me scroll back up. Um, one second. Almost there. Okay, so you see the point here is that the the identified region is in the non-gravitational part. And so the gravitational path integral, for its purpose, it's computing a it is computing something where you're not actually gluing any of these. So from the perspective of the gravitational path integral, these are separate boundaries. And yet you're still finding that they have to be connected. So this gluing is in is part of the of, a, of the non gravitational theory. We're not th this cut here is not done in the gravitational system, and so th the gravitational computation should factorize, unless it's doing something non trivial like some kind of an averaging. I see. Um, okay, I understand. So, but I have another question, which is I'm a little uneasy that, that um, so all these replica wormhole prescriptions seems to as the name suggests, come from doing a replica trick. But mm -hmm. the replica trick is just a trick for computing a log or it's something. So 
don't, is, are there um, situations where you're not doing any kind of replica trick and you still see the need for wormholes? And, and would that be, would that tell you better what they are? Because if you're always associating the wormholes with the replica trick, then uh -huh. you could just say that, well, you just did a trick to compute a log and in that there's some funky business going on there, but, but the, the canonical explanation of the replica wormholes is sort of missing because the replica trick is not a canonical calculation. Like a Hilbert yeah, calculation. Yeah, that's that, it, it's that, that's a really good question. Um, so there is a the, the short answer is uh, is not really. We don't uh, okay. I, I'll qualify in a second that what where the really comes in. But the, the short answer is that we don't really have another way of um, of doing this full calculation without the replica trick because the replica trick is in some sense what allows us to go from the partition function to the, um, to what allows us to involve the gravitational path integral in this. Now that said, the West Coast calculation is, um, is very powerful in the sense that they do um, a lot of non perturbative resummations. So they also um, are able to reproduce as parts of the page curve without um, doing the sort of saddle point analysis that involves these replica wormholes. But it's it's a little bit um, opaque in terms of what it what it gives us. So so one of the reasons for um, for this this investigation into log z and that replica trick is to uh, sort of try to understand. Okay, we have a different replica trick, but it's kind of the same theory. Do we still see the same behavior? Do we see something new? Can we understand these replica wormholes better by seeing them appear in other physical situations because it is it is kind of still a mystery what's going on here and part of it is that we have relatively few tools at our disposal for doing a calculation like um, uh, log z or minus trace row log row in the gravitational theory okay thank you mm -hmm. um, okay let's see where i was Okay, now for, for the moment, um, for now, we're just understanding the imprint of replica wormholes on um, observables that are computed directly from the generating functional, then um, we don't need this identification along the cut. We are just going to be interested in M copies of the system. There's no, not gonna be any kind of identification. And um, in particular, we're going to be um, looking at M copies of the ADS boundary. So we don't care about the flat region. We just say, okay, let's just take, so I should have said probably earlier, this is work with Alex Maloney and Sebastian Fischetti that came out um, July, 2020. And what we said is, okay, let's just imagine that we have an ADS two boundary conditions, no path, we're not coupling the system to anything. We don't care about this flat region. There's no identification anywhere. And we wanna know what is the uh, generating functional in this theory as computed by the computational path integral. And so the question becomes, is there a simple theory of gravity with a regime where these replica wormholes actually contribute to log Z at leading order, or at least as much as the disconnected topologies do? Because that would be a pre pretty strong evidence to say, okay, this thing is averaging, this is, is doing some, there's, there's very non-trivial non-factorization. And it wouldn't be, um, and, and, yeah, so, and, and, and that would be imprinted on, um, you know, essentially every observable. So in, in JT gravity and 2D gravity with the diloton, and then also in, in certain other cases, there have been um, quite a lot of studies of sort of lack of factorization due to co contributions of connected topologies to the gravitational path integral on, uh, the, this, on, on n copies of the asymptotic boundary. And it seems clear that if so, then these connected topologies should also contribute, if they contributed to PB to the M, they should contribute to one over M, PB to the M minus one. But the question is, do they actually contribute to log Z? And to understand that, we have to ask whether the, they continue to contribute as M goes to zero. And this analytic continuation is very subtle. And as it turns out, something very, very interesting happens. So I'm just gonna sort of say what it is that, that we found and give a picture because I don't have time to go into the technicalities for sure, um, but I'm happy to answer more questions afterwards. So we actually do find that replica wormholes give a larger contribution to log Z as to the quenched log Z than the disconnected topologies at sufficiently low temperatures. Oh, by the way, Nita, there's no yeah. 
just uh, there's no strict time constraint, so you really should take your time to explain whatever you want to. Okay. Okay. okay no I mean, yeah, I'll try not to go too too over. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, in fact, what we find is that the, the, if you just compute the disconnected topologies, if you say I don't like replica wormholes, I think they, that they're an artifact. I don't think they actually should contribute. If you just discount the, the connected topologies, you find a pathological free energy. And you know that it is not possible. You cannot include just the disconnected topologies. You have to include connected topologies in log Z. And, um, and I will say that this pathological behavior, actually, it appears to be somewhat mitigated by the inclusion of replica wormholes. But we unfortunately don't have enough control of the system to see if just including the replica wormholes is enough to um, to fix the, this, the pathology altogether. This pathology, I should I'll tell you, is um, this, this free energy is non-monotonic. So if the free energy is non-monotonic, you have a negative thermodynamic entropy, which is um, pathological and unphysical. And while the including the replica wormholes appears to at least um, improve the situation a bit, it is not, we don't have enough control to see if it fixes it or not. But um, so, so with a, if we just do a partial inclusion of the replica wormholes and we also resum the, um, the genus expansion, the free energy does still appear to be uh, at least a little bit non-monotonic with temperature, although the non-monotonicity is, is not nearly as bad as it is if you, um, if you include no replica wormholes at all. Now, there is, as it turns out, the thing that probably is responsible for this is that the analytic continuation is highly non-unique. In the case of the von Neumann entropy, you often have a theorem, Carleman's theorem, that guarantees for you the uniqueness of the analytic continuation. Uh, this is not the case for the replica trick for the log Z. So this, the simple analytic continuations appear to just be clearly wrong. It has to be a, a, a better one. And I, but one thing that's very interesting that we found is that this has a lot of parallels to replica symmetry breaking in spin glass systems where you also have this non-monotonic free energy in the uh, very non-monotonic annealed free energy. And when you include co correlations between replicas, then you find that it mitigates the system, the situation, but it doesn't fix it. And in order to fix it, you have to do a, an analytic continuation, um, the Parisian sets that breaks the replica symmetry. And so um, we, the, this seems to have a, quite a lot of parallels with the situation with spin glasses. Um, Neta, what system were you studying in this calculation? In this calculation, we're studying 2D diloton gravity. Okay. Mm -hmm. But so is it a pathology of that 2D theory or are you saying that in general that you expect this to be true? Uh, we, so that's a great question and it is something that we're working on now. Um, how general is this result? We were only, we worked strictly in that theory and it's that theory sometimes is identical in behavior to higher dimensional, more general theories. And sometimes it's not. And we are trying to figure out now whether this is one of those cases where it is, or if it's an artifact of this particular theory. So that's current work in progress. And I'm afraid that I, probably shouldn't comment on it because it's very much in flux right now. We, we do have, there are some indications that the phenomenon is more general, but I don't feel comfortable promising that given that we're still working it out. Um, I see, but about all the previous calculations uh, of say the page curve, is it, um, oh, has it yeah. been done in high dimensions or is it yes. still pretty, that's the, where you, you know is correct? Good, good. So um, two comments on that. So the, the sort of the most, um, so the replica wormhole calculations were done exclusively in two dimensions um, because we, the, this, this writing down these, these topologies in high dimensions is very hard. There are not that many known examples. The, the quantum extremal surface calculations on the other hand, you can do those in higher dimensions. It's a little bit, it's, it can be uh, tricky. So the most explicit direct calculation was done in, uh, J J in Dilaton 2D gravity plus matter, which can be thought of as a dimensional reduction of a, of a four dimensional theory. So in some sense, you could say that means that in four dimensions, that's exactly how it works because this is just a dimensional reduction. But uh, also separately, you can do, and have, but has been done by, by Jeff Pennington, a higher dimensional um, argument, essentially almost a proof 
that the same phenomenon has to work, has to appear in higher dimensions as well. This new quantum extremal surface formula, this new quantum extremal surface that um, contributes to the, um, the contributes at leading order to the, uh, to the calculation. So the most direct calculation was in 2D gravity plus matter, which again is a dimensional reduction, but you can also argue it in higher dimensions. So, so on, in these like doubly holographic models that people study, uh, like um, these papers of Rob Myers and so forth, you think that there are also replica wormholes there or because there are the extremal, common extremal island formula is there, but they don't, I don't remember if they said explicitly that the replica wormholes are the origin of the formula. That's right, we don't, we, we don't know. Um, there are some examples of, um, so there has been some follow-up work on replica wormholes in higher dimensions. And there are examples, but I don't think that we have control over the analysis at this point to know that they contribute at leading order. And um, in fact, there's also work by Don Meroff and George Santos, where they showed that even when they do, there are contributions from D brains that appear to potentially restore factorization. So I would say that the situation in high dimensions is a lot more in flux. Uh, but you still believe that, I mean, so the island formula you still believe is true. It's just the question of whether they come from replica wormholes. That That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So um, I'm just, I'm, I am starting to lose my voice as it's up here. So I'm going to try to finish up not too long from now. <clears throat> so what, what's, the, what's the main takeaway that um, I want you to take away from this, this discussion of the free energy? is that in at least um, some low dimensional theories of gravity, there exists at least one regime where replica wormholes have to make a large contribution to log Z to avoid various pathologies such as a non-monotonic um, free energy. And this requires some kind of a novel non-trivial analytic continuation with parallels with spin glasses um, and potentially the Parisian sets. So these two pictures right here are um, pictures of the, this is the annealed, free energy, and this is the quenched free energy. This is with um, partial resummation of the genus. So essentially what you can see is as you include more and more of these, um, of, of these connected topologies, the non-monotonicity appears to be getting mitigated, but it's not clear if you keep on high, going higher up, if it's gonna be resolved. This is the annealed free energy. And um, this, you, you, can, you can sort of think of this one as uh, including all of the higher topologies that involve adding candles to disconnected uh, topologies. And again, this is heavily non-monotonic and very pathological. Okay, so in the last um, remaining maybe 10 minutes or so, or however long it takes before I've lost my voice altogether, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more, a little bit about um, a different avenue of research, a different direction on trying to understand what Hawking's mistake was. This is sort of trying to understand why the quantum extremal surface formula is correct and what it means. But there's another direction that we can take and try to understand, which is um, what was Hawking's mistake? So we have two ways of computing the entropy of the Hawking radiation. Quantum extremal surface formula, the computational path integral, or Hawking's calculation, the Gaulle book transformations, quantum field theory and curved space time, et cetera. And both of these are in the regime of semi-classical gravity and they give different answers. So if we want to resolve the information paradox, we, one, th one thing we should ask is where do these two approaches diverge? Um, what makes them not agree with one another? If we want to understand how to modify Hawking's calculation in the language of Hawking's calculation how to, and, and get a unitary entropy, how to pinpoint where was, what was Hawking missing? Now, if you asked me before 2019 where Hawking went wrong in this calculation, I suspect that I would have said something along the lines of like, oh, you know, Harlow Hayden argued that decoding Hawking radiation um, is an exponentially difficult task. And this probably means that somehow, somewhere, Hawking's calculation lost track of exponentially complex data in the state of the, of the radiation. And the logic here is, um, it follows from an original ideas of Harlow and Hayden, developed further by Scott Aronson, and recently developed further by Kim Tang and Presco. When they showed that decoding the Hawking radiation after the page time, when you can start decoding it, assuming unitary evolution, is exponentially complex in the, in the size of the Hilbert space black hole. So Hawking's calculation 
potentially you say you could say it could be coarse graining over the outcomes of high complexity operations like this decoding protocol. Okay, that's pre-2019. We know things changed post-2019. So if you ask people now, I think most people would probably say something like, isn't it obvious? Hawking went wrong because he used the wrong saddle in the gravitational path integral. He used a disconnected saddle when he should have used the connected saddle. And then the wrong saddle, this disconnected saddle is, you know, the empty set, with non-minimal quantum extremal surface, quantum extremal surface stops being minimal after the page time. As a disclaimer, Hawking, you know, it's not clear where he started to just indiscriminately throw out exponentially complex data. And he certainly didn't use the gravitational path integral to do his calculation, but we're trying to bridge the gap here. We're trying to sort of understand how to recast Hawking's calculation in a language that um, can be made to bridge with the, with the recent calculation and the recent progress. Now we have two perspectives then on what was missing from Hawking's calculation. Maybe he was missing exponential complexity. Maybe he was using the wrong saddle. How are these two perspectives compatible with one another? And by understanding the way in which these two, mis these two mistakes, dropping complexity using the wrong saddles are one and the same, then we can get a rapid understanding, at least at a level of, uh, of, of holography, of where what Hawking's calculation was really missing and how do we sort of put it back in? How do we resolve the information paradox, which does boil down to pinpointing what was Hawking's mistake? So what does it mean uh, in terms of the Lorentzian bulk geometry to implement ignorance of high complexity data? And also, what does it mean to use the wrong saddle in the gravitational path integral? Now, the second one we kind of know the answer to already. It means using the, the wrong quantum extremal surface, min non-minimal quantum extremal surface. But how do we implement ignorance of high complexity data? How do we, what, what's the geometric prescription for that? And how can we repackage A and B here into one unified statement about where Hawking went wrong? And this brings me to late, 2019, late 2019, which is the so-called Python's lunch proposal. So uh, motivated by tensor network models, um, Brown, Garibian, Suskind, and Pennington propose that if you have a non-minimal quantum extremal surface in the entanglement wedge, meaning closer to the boundary than the minimal quantum extremal surface. So here we have a minimal quantum extremal surface and the non-minimal one, there's a non-minimal one that's closer to the asymptotic boundary. Then reconstruction, decoding, in other words, of the region behind the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, this region here, is exponentially complicated. So in other words, in the evaporating black hole, everything that is in, encoded in the radiation would be exponentially complicated to reconstruct. So here we have, uh, they call this the Python's lunch because the geometry looks kind of like the Python's lunch in Le Petit Prince. So this is, don't blame me for that name, that is theirs. Um, C here is the bifurcation surface of the event horizon. So just, just the event horizon, some non-minimal quantum extremal surface. Then there's always going to be a bulge in the Cauchy slice. This is a moment of time slice here. And then here's the minimal quantum extremal surface. And the complexity of decoding anything between this surface and this one is going to be exponential in the generalized entropy, the difference between this bulge and this non-minimal quantum extremal surface. So this starts to provide a bridge between Expo dropping something that's exponentially complex and using the wrong quantum extremal surface. Here, this is non-minimal, it's the wrong quantum extremal surface and everything behind it is exponentially difficult to reconstruct. But in order to have a definitive connection and not just an intuitive or rough one between coarse grading over complexity and the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, we need a sort of a stronger form of the Python's lunch. We need more than just everything that's between this surface and that one is exponentially complex. We need to know that non-minimal quantum extremal surfaces are the only source of exponential complexity. We need an if and only if here. So this is the, the strong, so-called the strong Python's lunch. And I should say this is work um, that I did with Jeff Pennington and Arvind Shabazi Mogadon. So I think, um, this here, what, what comes next is a very technical interlude that essentially argues in favor of this uh, 
this strong Python's lunch and why it works. I think I'm going to um, skip this unless there are questions at, at the end. I'll be happy to answer uh, questions on those. This is this is fairly technical. Um, and let me just go ahead to uh, looking ahead. So um, where are we moving now with the black hole information paradox? I think you'll ask three different physicists and you'll get five different answers, of course. But um, here's my take on it. If you ask me to summarize the current state of the information paradox in one sentence, I would say that we haven't solved it yet. But we are getting closer. And here are some questions that uh, I think we will be thinking about for the uh, months, maybe years to come. What is the entropy that the quantum extremal surface or the gravitational path and the goal is uh, what, what, that they're calculating? In other words, how can we do a direct minus trace row long row calculation without going through the replica trick? What is the state row that goes into this that gives us unitarity in quantum gravity? What is an observer outside the black hole actually measure? If we had an arbitrarily powerful observer with a, an arbitrarily powerful quantum computer, what do they actually measure? Is the path integral actually doing some kind of an averaging or are there non-perturbative corrections that come in to fix the factorization? What are the internal dynamics of an evaporating black hole? How does the information actually get out? And where did Hawking go wrong? Which is something that we have to answer in order to solve the information problem. So with that, I will close and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful uh, seminar and lecture. Any question from the audience, please feel free to ask or raise your hand first if you want. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. please, so please. Are, are, are you saying that there is hope to compute the entropy via minus trace row log row semi-classically? No. Or semi -class <laughs> okay. No, I don't think there's hope of computing it semi-classically, but I think by having the semi-classical computation, we potentially have a hope of understanding what goes into it at the quantum gravity level. Although I hope, I hope I'm proven wrong on this. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a very basic question. Mm -hmm. So the, this real Takanagi form with uh, the uh, entropy, you can think of it in terms of tensor networks and the, um, the, the entropy comes from cutting the tensor network. Is there a picture like that for this uh, corrected form of quantum extremal surface? And does it give any insight to what is going on in the black hole situation? That's a very good question. Um, so there isn't really a... There isn't really a tensor network picture of it that captures all of the requisite properties. Um, there is some, okay, I should say, I'm doing some work with uh, collaborators, um, Daniel Harlow, Jeff Pennington, Chris Akers, and Shreya Vardhan on trying to develop such a tensor network, um, probably involving non-isometric codes. But there's no, currently there isn't one. It's, it's, uh, it has a number of unusual properties that are, are a little difficult to implement, but um, in particular, that they're, the, these the sensors are not going to be isometries. Uh, so that makes it a little harder. Now, even if we can write down a tensor network, I think that will, that will give some insight. But part of the issue of tensor networks is that they're very um, static. So it will only capture what's happening at a given moment in time. And of course, the page curve the whole point of the page curve is that it's something that's very dynamical and changing in time. And we don't yet have a uh, time dependent, uh, even for the Ryu Takenagi, for uh, the covariant version, the time dependent version of Ryu Takenagi, we don't actually have a good tensor network model of that. So we could, um, and again, we are working on a quantum corrected version that will work in the static case, but it doesn't mean that we'll be able to actually um, understand the page curve from that because we'll still have, we'll have the hurdle of time dependence at that point. Thank you. So as much as I don't want to have information uh, get lost, I also don't want to have a Nathan's voice get lost. So I hope her voice- I'm not sure be, what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your voice will recover Thank and you. come back. But I really find your voice is really sound. Not not problem at all. Okay. <laughs> it sounds all clear to me. 
not not even sensing the problem. So, uh, any more questions, comments? Please feel free. Uh, yeah, I have a question, and um, yeah, just so uh, sorry about your voice. Don't let me <laughs> drag on too long. No worries. But uh, one thing I'm a bit confused about. You, you asked, what is the quantum extreme surface formula calculating? But I, um, so you still, we do have an answer in the boundary. You still think that it is minus trace row log row for the boundary yes. CIT, right? Yes, yes. But we'd like to have it in gravitational language. That's right, yeah. Um, so what about, uh, so there is a paper of Jaffis Koshmeyer for JT gravity. They do give you a bulk interpretation of the, uh, um, HRT formula, it is minus trace D times row log row. There's some kind of defect inserted in there. Uh -huh. And um, in and, and following that general philosophy, you could try in low dimensions, like two and three dimensions, to try to basically define a factorization of the bulk Hilbert space. Uh -huh. um, and, and there might be some analog of this defect. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, so would, I mean, and in other words, a very naive uh, idea would be, um, boundary entanglement entropy should be due to bulk entanglement entropy. So the thing you're computing in the bulk is, is just an entanglement entropy of the bulk gravitational theory. And uh, I'm just curious, would you accept that as a likely uh, conjecture or? Uh, yeah, I actually, I do think that's, um, I mean, the, this, this, the area term in the, in the von Neumann entropy it, uh, formula, in the holographic formula, the area term, I think is really just computing um, even in high dimensions, I, my guess would be it's computing some kind of uh, computing the entropy of the gravitational field. And there is a way of rewriting it. The whole thing is a minus trace row log row. We know that from the boundary perspective. And I suspect that if we knew how to treat the bulk correctly, then we would be able to rewrite the area term as the entropy contribution from the gravity, the, the, the bulk entropy contribution from the gravitational field. So I think I, I find that um, that interpretation to be very likely. Um, but of course, we have to quantitatively understand it in, in general. I see. Um, and do you have any, like, uh, I mean, would you extend that to talking about the bulk string theory? Like, would you consider, I mean, so, so if I had to ask you, what is the bulk string theory interpretation of this quantum extremo island formula? Would that still be bulk string theory in tangible entropy? You know, I might have said that, um, a few months ago, but there was a paper that came out from um, like Tom Faulkner and collaborators that essentially, I don't, it, it wasn't conclusive in how the problem gets resolved, but it did bring up the issue that once you add string, once you consider stringy effects, the quantum extremal surface formula appears like, that, that it appears like it would have to be dramatically modified. So I actually am not sure what, what the, What's the deal once you start adding stringy corrections? So, I mean, perturbative corrections, I would have thought would be fine, but they actually showed when you have this quantum extremal island um, that string scattering can actually have very dramatic effects. So I actually, I, I don't, I think I, I just don't know at this point. I, I would have, I, I thought I knew a few months ago, but it turns out that, that there's more, uh, more mysterious effects here. I see, thank you. All right, I think it's probably about the time. So we hope the information is recovered and the name is also recovered soon. I think it's really good, good, no problem for me. So actually, okay, so that's it. So thank you very much, Neha. I thank you for, for all the people who attend. Thanks. Thank you. Very thank, much. you. thank you. And thanks, Neta, I'll follow up with the YouTube link and uh...